Good evening, everybody. We'll, we'll make a start. Are we ready to begin? I uh, call everybody to order. Yes, okay. That's the only way to do it. Yeah, that's the best way. Utraoin, Kahirlok, Udras, Nahalskola, Aina Special to Augustagin Ushla, Fulcherov Higan, Okad Special to Show, Honan Lower, Connemara, and elsewhere, Ahiola. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special occasion to launch the book Connemara and elsewhere. We're very much honoured by the presence of Tim and Mairead Robinson this evening, as well as some very eminent speakers from whom you will hear shortly. Firstly, however, as university librarian, I'd like to say how excited we are that Tim has so generously donated his archive to NUI Galway. The archive is a magnificent treasure trove of materials compiled in Tim's research, writing and mapping of Connemara, the Aran Islands and the Burren. It ranges from almost 12,000 index cards with notes on place names to first editions of his books and maps to geological samples. You can get a sense of this wonderful archive in the exhibition Interpreting Landscape, Tim Robinson at the West of Ireland, which is on display in the atrium nearby. That exhibition references other complementary landscape archives in our collections, notably the Eamon de Butler archive, whose donation to us Tim very helpfully influenced through his friendship with Eamon and Lally, who's here present as well this evening. Behind the acquisition of every archive in the James Hardiman Library, there, there's a story, and the case of Tim's co uh, collection is one of a narrow escape from the elements. Tim and Mairead urged us to transfer the archive from their beautiful but exposed house in Roundstone last October before they went away for a few months. And during their absence, the West Coast was battered by violent storms and the Atlantic made some incursions into the basement, which is exactly where the archive had been located. And I think it would have been destroyed had it not been moved promptly. So a big thanks to you for hurrying us up on that occasion and well done to Kieran Hoare for making that transfer happen promptly. It's clear that Tim has given us a major treasure and will make sure that his archive serves current and future students and scholars in many disciplines from NUI Galway and well beyond. Dan Carey will say more about the significance of the archive for our academic programmes later. The challenging task of cataloguing this massive resource has begun with valuable advice from Tim and from Nessa Cronin and our ultimate vision would be to digitise the archive so that we can open it up to the widest possible range of audiences, public as well as academic. The exhibition I mentioned while featuring the archive has as its prime focus the book, which will be launched this evening. And in that context, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Professor Jane Conroy, who has been the driving force in organising today's seminar, exhibition and book launch, and is the editor of Connemara and elsewhere. So can I hand over to you, Jane? Thank you very much, John. And I'd like to begin by saying what a pleasure it has been over the last uh, number of weeks to work with the library. I think um, that combination of the Moore Institute and library collaboration was, was fruitful and for all of us, um, I, I think an interesting trip as well. Uh, we're very pleased with the exhibition, so I hope you all have time to look at that. Uh, I, I will speak briefly, and I just wanted to concentrate on um, one or two things, um, perhaps the first of them would be um, Tim Robinson himself, if I might, and uh, to say that as we hold the events that we're holding today, um, it's really for not just the generosity of his gift to the university, but also for his long-standing contribution to this region. It's a, a contribution um, which has actually served to put the regions of Connemara, Burren and Arran on, on the map, literally and metaphorically on the world map. And I think um, it's a tribute to, to Tim Robinson that uh, it's, it's so easy to generate interest in this. It's so easy to ask people to come and hear him or to see what he's done. So to say something about his relationship to the region, um, what, what do we actually see when we look at a Tim Robinson map and begin with the maps. So we, we see, obviously, we see the places, we see the marks on the surface of the map, we see all of that. But beneath that, the underpinnings beneath that, more than the place names, are the people that he has consulted along the way. And, and that's really what I wanted to focus on now. We see the places, we see the network of routes, we see maybe places with no routes to them. I, I, I mean routes in the sense the Americans would say routes um, rather than routes, uh, as, as Tim would call them, tethers. Um, 
so we see that, but we also see every time we look at the map, I think we should also be aware of the people that Tim met on his, on his travels around Connemara and around the Burn and around Arran. That <clears throat> these people are the people who fed the information, and I don't think uh, that uh, in any sense it diminishes the work to say that. Uh, there's a moment in the interview recorded with uh, Tim on the, which many of you have seen this afternoon, the interview which Vincent has done with Tim, uh, where he evokes that those meetings with people, he evokes the way in which, uh, in fact, he was welcomed into people's houses, given the information. And I think one humorous moment where he says that um, people sometimes were impatient. They said, you should have been here long ago. Uh, we, we were expecting you uh, because of the Connacht Tribune um, column. They expected him to turn up at some stage to find out what that hill was called or that rock or what its significance was. Uh, but what I wanted to say really on behalf of everybody here, and particularly for those of us who are from the region, um, that uh, we honour him as well for the total respect which he has always paid um, the people, the place, law and culture which he has um, garnered in, in this long, long trip around these areas. And we called one of the panels in the exhibition Voices and Places because so many of the marks on the maps are an expression of people as well. So I think it's something we shouldn't lose sight of because we're so focused on landscape today, we want to remember the figures in the landscape. So that um, has been um, something that over the years, Tim and Moraith as well have made this immense contribution through the Randstone conversations and in many other ways. Uh, the connection that Tim and Morith had to the university it goes back a long way as well. And I think that they're here present, many of the members of the university who responded to, to Tim, who corresponded with Tim on areas as diverse as geology and seaweed. Um, I think Mike Gary is there. I see uh, various people who um, have been helpful, I think, along the way. So the, I just, the relationship there between the university and Tim has been one of mutual support, I think, um, one which we honour today, which we're very proud today. And the archive will mean a lot in the future, because in the archive you can actually see the working methods used uh, in this immense work. And that, I think, is going to bring researchers to us in, in many many fields really who can cross disciplines and who we hope will be able to use that with the same kind of open-minded inquiry which Tim Robertson brought to the, the work. I think this, the last thing I would really say is that uh, I'd like to say that the other great enjoyable thing that I've done recently has been working with uh, the Robinsons, with Nicolas Feve and with John Elder uh, each of whom would like to thank profoundly for, for what they've done, uh, to highlight the fact that the work that they've done is creative, original, and extremely harmonious uh, in the working relationships and in everything else they did. The other really good relationship I'd like to underline is the one between the university and the Royal Irish Academy, but I will leave that to the president of the Royal Irish Academy. But I'd like, before uh, stepping down, to thank Ruth Hegarty, in particular for her um, vision, in fact, in sponsoring this book through all the review processes uh, that were necessary and for seeing that it could be an unusual, what I think of as a landmark book. And I'd also like to mention, of course, the university's support and that of the Galway University Foundation, who were particularly, uh, again, visionary in seeing the interest that this book could present. So. Uh, so I think, thanking everybody again, I'd like to invite the, the Professor Mary Daly as President of the Royal Irish Academy to, to clamber up onto the podium. Thank you very much, and it's lovely to be here this evening. I always like visiting Galway. And I'm going to take up where Jane left off by saying that this has been a, a very happy partnership between the Royal Irish Academy and NUI Galway. And I really want to echo what Jane said. I want to thank the president of NUIG, Jimmy Brown. I want to thank uh, the chair, Tom Joyce, who's chair of the Galway University Foundation. And then I want to thank 
the indescribably wonderful Jane A. Conroy, because um, this is the second occasion I've spoken about this book. I, had, I spoke about it in the Academy on Thursday, but as Ruth Hegarty said, this is the launch. We had to launch it in Galway. We couldn't launch it. That was just a pre-launch event. Um, um, and it is a most magnificent and beautiful book. And anybody who knows Jane Conroy can see her DNA, her fingerprints all over it in terms of the elegance of language, the elegance of layout, and the a choice of contributors. And I think it's just a remarkable publication. And I would join with Jane in congratulating, complimenting John Elder and Nicola for their remarkable work. Um, I want to, of course, uh, mention the most important person here tonight, and that is Tim Robinson, who is, we are proud to say, is a member of the Academy. And what I think is so, most, so wonderful about Tim is that his interests are so much, bring us back into some of the greatest traditions of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, his work on maps and field studies uh, is reminiscent of the Ordnance Survey, which is very much a central collection uh, and interest in the Academy. And of course, the great Robin Lloyd Prager and Nessa Cronin mentioned him this afternoon. And uh, I think this, we have a worthy successor there. And when I was reading through uh, that book about two weeks ago when I got it, I found myself coming across references to Karna and Gurumna. And they brought me back to a research I did for teaching back as a young lecturer when I was working through the proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy and the ethnographic accounts of the late 19th century of those islands. And it's just wonderful to see a degree of intellectual continuity in the same, in the sa in the same fashion. So in a sense, what we have here is yet another link in a long and distinguished chain. A, a chain of scholarship which is truly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, which brings together language, history, landscape, field studies, and a knowledge of the underlying geology and marine biology as well. The final point I want to make is that in honouring Tim, we are honouring somebody who's in a great scholarly tradition, a scholar who pursues the passions of research for its own sake not because it promotes a career, not because it comes up with some great say, corporate or commercial dividends, but because of the love of the knowledge. And uh, Tim, we honour you for that. And it is a privilege to be, speak here tonight about you and your work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute for, for Research in the Humanities and Social Studies. This is the seminar room that we use here. Our, our space is at the top of this building, so we feel very much at home here. What I wanted to do is just to say a few words about uh, the archive that the Robinsons have given to the university and to the library. Um, I started the day at the symposium that Jane Conroy organized on interpreting landscape by talking about the remarkable reach of Tim Robinson's work say something about the archive. Its connections speak to so many areas of activity that the university is interested in and that we want to develop and that we're currently active in. The area of landscape studies, for example, in which Tim's work offers fundamental insight and a kind of model is, is one that speak, comes to mind immediately. His books and maps engage with archaeology, with geography, with cartography, natural history, history of science, oral history, I think, as well, folklore, Irish studies, place names, Gaelge, geography and mathematics, to name a few. I'm sure I could go on. And then there's his writing, the virtuosity of which is an occasion of study it itself as a part of the poetics of landscape. This is a truly humanistic enterprise, and therefore at the heart of the Moore Institute's priorities, but also one that bridges divides between art, literature, and science. I now want to introduce Vincent Woods, who's going to speak to us in a moment. Vincent is a poet and playwright, also a songwriter, I might add, author of, collection, of the collection Lies and Miracles that engages with the Leitrim landscape through poetry and image. I wanted to mention that in particular. Uh, among his plays, A Cry from Heaven at the Black Pig's uh, Dyke, and numerous other works. He's a former writer in residence at NUI Galway, so we kind of claim him for ourselves, and a member of Aesdana. You'll recognize him instantly from his voice as presenter of the art show on RT Radio 1. 
where the huge range of his interest is apparent and his deep curiosity about the arts in all their forms in Ireland and beyond. Vincent. Romila Margaret Dan, and uh, indeed, uh, can I echo Mary Daly in saying what a pleasure it is to be here this evening to pay a small tribute to Tim Robinson and his work. And it has meant a great deal to me in the last month or so to be a, a very small part of uh, making this archive uh, through the film and um, talking to John and to Nicholas in uh, the RIA and <coughs> Tim on Thursday night. A dream of limestone in sea light where gulls have placed their perfect prints. Reflection in that final sky shames vision into simple sight, into pure sense. And that poem from Derek Mann's Thinking of Inishir in Cambridge, Mass. I thought of in reading this book, Connemara and elsewhere, because the book is full of poetry and light. The illuminations of word, on word, of photograph, on word and place, of mind and memory stretching into old new terrains, of spots of time seen, held, named, and set free again into a future of infinite elsewheres, which are heart anchored to the little Gaelic kingdom of Connemara. It's a book to savour slow as a tart sweet apple from an old abandoned orchard to return to time and again for another bite, a dip, a new glint of insight, a fresh, unexpected angle of seeing. And it is a reminder of how full and complete and enriching life can be when the poet stands in the rain every day, when the photographer stands in stillness to capture shadow and light, when Tim Robinson's vision is honoured, matched and, light again, illuminated. Jane Conroy has done a magnificent job of editorship and editing, of steering this elegant boat of a book to harbour and home, and a perfect crew. With her, John Elder, whose reading of Tim Robinson's work is acute, generous, wide-ranging and wise. Nicholas Feb, whose photographs float timeless out of ether, out of word, world, stone, water, bone, sky, wool, and flesh. And Tim Robinson himself, looking to the horizon through a prism of eternal past and eternal now, in search of lost time, found time, time astray, seen, recalled, hoped for, and reimagined. The book is beautiful, as many of you will have seen, impeccably conceived, designed, and made, all credit to NUI Galway to the Royal Irish Academy and to the Galway University Foundation for it. It's a book of three halves and more. First, John Elder, whose own writing on poetry, place and landscape evoke Vermont and worlds unfurling from it, reading The Mountains of Home and The Frog Run, two of his recent books. He rightly summons Wordsworth, Robert Frost and Joseph Brodsky in assessing and placing in context the remarkable writings of the man whose work we celebrate here today. One of the many important points he makes in unfolding the map, his introduction to this book, is that Tim Robinson's achievements have enormous value for all of us who feel passionately affiliated with richly, richly marginalised landscapes. Robinson offers a crucial resource, says Elder, to anyone seeking to assert the history and value of their homes far from the capitals. So I think of North Leitrim and South Fermanagh, rich, impoverished places, ear and eye and dollar marked for fracking. The landscapes of Henry Glassie's beloved Ballymanone, of John McKenna's shining music, of my own people, farmers and coal miners, and an unnamed girl from Arigna who died in the famine when my great-great-grandmother gave her a bowl of gruel to eat on her hungry walk home with a backload of nettles. And the poor body was beyond sustenance or survival and caved in. Her simple gravestone unmapped in Tarman 
marked with a broken rising sun carved by her stonemason father. The old people always said Arigna and Keiju for Arigna and Kiju. We let them pass. Part two of the book, Nicholas Feve's Browsing Connemara, a photographic record, black and white images that shine with light and muted color. No cliche here, no easy, inevitable images of abandoned things or unnamed characters in an exotic landscape. Instead, photograph responds to text, plays with it, reaches for it, is not afraid to not capture the moment, to say there was a day when I almost got the perfect photograph, but on that day I had no camera. And you'll see that image on page 95 of the book. Blurs of wool on a barbed wire fence wave in the mind when the book is closed for sleep. The speckled flank of a horse mirrors mackerel sky. Thank you, John Elder, for helping me re-see the connection between those two images. Flatness is true, and the contours of Connemara swirl in the playful remaking of goggle-eyed lost pool text. As Tim Robinson points out, Fev explores the materiality of the photograph itself, and as was mentioned earlier, the comradeship and sibling rivalry of text and image is examined with deep sensitivity and just the right smidgen of humour. Nicholas Feb is a poet of the eye, of the lens, of the seen and made image that float out of invisibility towards light, a perfect match. Part three, elsewhere by Tim Robinson, with, with three new exquisite pieces of writing, where are the nows of yesteryear, the Tower of Silence, and Contrascarp. Real places, Terre Haute in Indiana, the streets around the Irish Cultural Centre in Paris, his grandparents' home, a remembered tower block, all mingled with real and imagined memory and what ifs. A touch of Lewis Carroll here, a hint of Sebald, the unmistakable ear and tone of Robinson, a flavour of the future beyond the ABC of Earth Wonders, Aaron, the Baron and Connemara. I won't say more than that. Tim will read from one of those sections in a moment. But let me remember that a few years ago, Seamus O'Cahan told me how the folklorist and writer Michael J. Murphy took him to visit an old man in Glangevelin, County Cavan, another of those glorious, wild, marginalised places that enrich life. The old man, likely a McGovern, met them at the door and in a gallant gesture of welcome, kissed Seamus' hand, grateful for someone who would appreciate value and write down for the future some of his store of knowledge, of place names, of life, of language, of history, of what we call tradition. That simple gesture seems to me perfect in its eloquent grace. So, Tim, <laughs> consider your hand and hands kissed and blessed by <laughs> all of us. Uh, may they steer your compass and pen to many many rich elsewheres and nows and pools of light and shining darkness. Thon lawr sio mar wad bán la anam gial mar sioal feilacán bwí ar lóv an mar nélach. Gormila Michael, Tim Robbins. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Vincent. I'm made uh, very proud and indeed deeply moved by the reception that the work has received from the university. I've been in and out of uh, Galway University so often during my 40 years in the West that uh, I begin to uh, delude myself that I must be a member of staff. <laughs> but I'm not actually, I'm an eternal student of the university. Um, I have a lot of people to thank. I'm sure to miss out uh, somebody who's crucial, um, and I'll explain why they can uh, congratulate themselves if they are missed out in that sense. Uh, chiefly, Nicola. Now, the kernel of the book is uh, Nicola's um, photographic essay, and uh, is uh, a, a great work of uh, patience, of ingeniosity, of creative endeavour, and I thank him from the bottom of my heart. Um, 
I must thank John Elder for his, for his lovely, wise and beautifully written preface, and Jane for her meticulous and tireless uh, editing. I don't know how many editorial meetings we've had in, in our place, and Jane must have had many, many others in many other places. Uh, Nessa, Kieran Hoare in the archival department, Ashling, um, Neil McSweeney, Mel Durkin, and in the RIA, Ruth Hegarty and Roisin Jones, and Fidelma. Uh, this is the Moore Foundation in the university in particular, Dan Carey, Vincent Woods, who you've just been listening to with such pleasure, and John Cox in the library. And uh, I think um, if I have missed out anybody, he or she can uh, comfort her himself or herself with the thought that actually she or he was the kingpin or queenpin <laughs> of the enterprise. Thank you. At the end of it is uh, the, the elsewhere part of the story. And this is where I begin to dig myself an escape tunnel from Connemara. Um, there's three brief prose pieces, each of which is uh, autobiographical to one extent or another. This one is called Where Are the Nows of Yesteryear? And it might help if I uh, indicated quickly where I got the title. It's, of course, based on Where Are the Snows of Yesteryear? Uh, a few years ago, I spent some time in Cambridge and I did what I never dared do when I was a student at Cambridge, uh, that was go to meetings of the Moral Sciences Club, um, because that was where the ghosts of uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein and other all-time greats still hammer out their battles on each other's crania. Uh, one of the chief uh, proponents of, of uh, the, one of the chief um, participants in uh, talks in the Moral Sciences Club was uh, Professor Hugh Miller, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy. His main interest was uh, time, and he talked a good deal about the concept of the now, the fleeting moment. And at the end of uh, all that, I came out not very much the wiser about the nature of time, but I did have in my mind this absurd title, Where are the Nows of Yesteryear? And I carried it around in my mind for a long time before finding some material to, to fit through it. So this piece that I've finally written to it about that, stemming from the title, is in uh, eight or nine longish paragraphs, each of which uh, begins and ends in the word now, and perhaps demonstrates some uses of the word now that uh, don't fit into Professor Mello's theories. Now that so much time has passed since my childhood, I must admit the possibility that the, the clear image I retain of my grandmother's musical box has long been polished into luminosity by nostalgia. The quaint old device stood on a low occasional table in her little antique shop, overshadowed by towering wardrobes and crowding tall boys, but glinting as if with an internal, internal energy. Its simple, almost naive mechanism fascinated me. A spring-powered contraption, like the works of an old clock, drove the rotation of a brass cylinder, on which were hundreds of prickles that twanged the teeth of a graduated steel comb, producing hesitant and plaintive melodies. This tender machinery was mounted on a polished wooden base and covered by a lid with glass sides, through which I could admire the tense, coiled spring and dark, laborious cogs watch the hypnotically slow turning of the gleaming cylinder, and sense the tiny flexure and straining of a tooth of the dull grey comb as each note was prepared, seemed momentarily to resist being detached from silence, and then yielded with a slight reluctance like a ripe blackberry plucked from a briar. Years later, when I read H.G. Wells' description of the time machine, a glittering contraption of bronze and crystal, I was carried back to that fusty old shop in the quiet North Wales town of Mould. Had I realised then that the musical box was indeed a time machine, I would have asked my grandmother for it. She would have kept it for me, and it would be on my desk now. Now, here's a curious fact about travelling back in time. 
Philosophers like to illustrate its difficulties, and perhaps its impossibility, by considering the case of an imaginary time traveller who travels back in time to kill off one of his or her grandparents at such an early age as to preclude his own birth, and thus his dreadful deed. The fascination of this traditional vein of logical argument obscures an underlying fantasy, unthinkable, not only in its paradoxicality, but ethically, combining as it does both murder and a very esoteric form of suicide. <laughs> Among our eminent contemporaries who have scratched their heads over the paradox, Professor Hugh Meller of Cambridge has a version that targets the grandfather, while Professor Michael Lockwood of Oxford opts for the grandmother. But if I could meet my, pa my grandparents again, far from shortening their lives, I would expend a little of my own in trying to salvage at least a memory of theirs. How little I know of them. What was their background? I remember my grandmother, shortly before she died, uh, telling me that, my grand that her grandfather once ate his dinner off the face of the clock on the Liver building in Liverpool. My parents dismissed this as the ramblings of old age when I reported it to them, but I take it as truth and like to think that this great-great-grandfather of mine was a, a city dignitary who partook of a banquet for which the clock face served as a table before its installation marked the completion of Liverpool's temple of mercantilism. No doubt the mayor or some such grandee sat at the head of the table, that is, at 12 o'clock. What o'clock, what potential now, did my grandmother's grandfather represent? But I know nothing about this almost fabulous ancestor. Indeed, uh, my memories of my grandparents themselves are hardly more than textural. When I ride back in time, on the musical box perhaps, to Mould, the very name capture, recaptures the little town as it was when my parents used to bring me there on occasional holiday lift visits almost a lifetime ago, I encounter on the staircase behind the shop the soft, indulgent bulk of my grandmother and glimpse my tall, rigid grandfather, ignoring me out of shyness rather than antipathy, and turning away in the door, door space of a further room. Now that I'm old enough to be the grandfather of the child I then was, I can understand something of the distance he chose to occupy, but I cannot communicate this fellow feeling, for that was then, as they say, and this is now. Now and again, I used to lose myself in two paintings that hung on that staircase, La Rix, the brawl by Maisonnier, Queen Victoria's favourite painter, and Mies Angelus, so much admired by Salvador Dali. Both represent instants of stasis. In the first, the Maisonnier, a pack of cards lies scattered on the floor among overturned table, chairs and wine bottles. Two gamblers have leapt to confront each other and are being restrained by their companions. One of the antagonists has a dagger. A man behind him tries to twist it out of his grasp while another seizes him round the chest. It can hardly have been my gentle grandmother who told me that the model for the man with the dagger is said to have died of his frustrated existence in this role. The other would-be fighter is trying to draw his sword, but is obstructed by a fifth man who holds him back with one arm and stretches out, towards the other, stretches out the other arm towards the face of the man with the dagger, hand wide open and fingers crooked in a gesture that shouts, no, so loudly that time is stopped. Every detail of the scene is meticulously rendered, though one could scarcely call the result lifelike. My sonnier masters time, and here is a moment preserved as if under brown varnish, but space is beyond him. As one critic has written, his prodigious powers of decomposition left him incapable of putting anything together again. <laughs> and in this painting, the dimension of depth is slightly awry, and distances have been misjudged, so that figures seem to step through each other. But perhaps this unshapely space is masterly, Einsteinian, a general relativity of drunken rage. The other painting, the Mie, in contrast, offers contemplative stillness. The chimes of the Angelus, conducted by a flock of rooks high in the evening sky, come from a church tower 
on the horizon of an endless plain to two potato pickers. The young couple stand with bowed heads, at their feet a half-filled basket. They are statuesque figures, alone in the vast emptiness. In one of his homages to this painting, Dali transforms them into rook-haunted ruinous towers, much taller than the funereal cypresses growing around their bases. Dali, with his X-ray eyes, also made out that Mie has painted the potato basket over the representation of a coffin, in which perhaps the two peasants had brought their dead child for burial. In another interpretation of the scene, Dali diagnoses sexual tension. He depicts the moment after that of the Angelus, in which the male peasant leaps at the female as urgently as Mysonia's furious gamesters strive to stab each other. Of course, as a child, I was aware of none of these hypothetical histories. For me, each of the two paintings in the staircase was a banner, parading through all time an ancient and incomprehensible now. Now or never, having awoken my grandparents' old house from the comfortable doze it has enjoyed in my memory for so long, is the time to record another aspect of it before the mice of forgetfulness gnaw it all away. Behind the front ground floor room occupied by the shop, down a few stairs, was a semi-basement. A mere coal hole, I suppose. But it seemed spacious to me, into which coal coke used to be avalanched every now and then through a hatch in the rear wall of the house. I liked to stand on a wooden step by the coke hill and look out of this hatch, my chin on a level with the cobbles of the back lane. Opposite, the parish church towered among tall trees. The shadowy space between the backs of the houses and the churchyard wall was projected into the unreal by my worm's eye perspective on it. When, just now, I summoned up maps and photographs from the internet, I found that this little region of mystery no longer exists. The back lane and the terrace houses of which my grandparents was one have been swept away and replaced by a sloping lawn, a civic amenity offering a view of the old church from the main street. The lane mattered to me because it led to a children's playground with a few swings, a small roundabout and a pair of parallel bars. As a devotee of Tarzan, I was proud of my ability to hang by my knees from one of these bars. My head must have been close to the ground in this position, for once, when my long-suffering knees relaxed their grip, I came down with a thump that sent me wailing back along the lane, but did no visible damage to my skull. I could say that I've never been the same since, <laughs> but that's true of every moment of my life. My image of myself, upside down, bat-like, in the rectangular space below the bar, like that of myself at the hatch with my chin on its sill, gives me a measure of my size at that time of my life. Our subjective experience of the flow of time, says Hugh Miller, is no evidence that time really does flow. What we actually experience is change in ourselves, the accumulation of memories, of memories of memories. This must include memories of stages in physical growth, and of the incidents that knock such memories into our heads. My brief surrender to gravity, my tearful return down the lane, are lodged in the loops of my great brain stuff, as are my grandfather quelling, his sobs with, quelling my sobs with the testy formula, now then, and my grandmother applying as a verbal salve to my sore head a soft dove-like repetition of, now, now. <laughs> now. And uh, to end, let me open what has always felt to me to be the secret heart of my grandparents' house. At floor level, in a corner of the sitting room, was a cupboard full of games that must have been old-fashioned even in those days of my childhood. Sometimes I would delve into it before breakfast, when there was a faint acrid tang of dead ashes in the room, as yet unvisited by the day's routines. There were tiddlywinks and marbles, packs of cards for playing happy families, and shallow boxes that opened up into trays scattered with cardboard fish one could angle for with a little magnet on a string. On the floor of the cupboard, or between the leaves of big illustrated books, I used occasionally to find a more valuable fish, escaped perhaps from a long-lost pouch. 
They were delicately cut out from wafers of a pearly translucent material and must have been tokens in an antique parlour game, as I realised much later when I read in a Jane Austen novel of a girl who, after an evening visit, could talk of nothing but the fish she had won and the fish she had lost. Most precious of all was a set of ivory spillikins in a narrow little box, also of ivory, with a delicately fretted lid. Each spillikin had a slender stem, some four inches long, and a head representing a Chinese sage, a sickle moon, a long-tailed bird, or some fabulous species of animal. Piled on a tabletop, they formed a tangle from which, with the aid of a little hook, one tried to extract one spillikin at a time without causing the least trembling amongst the rest. An operation as delicate as that of capturing an elusive memory without awakening others interlinked with it that one would rather leave undisturbed. Where is this test of the subtle and steady hand now? At the bottom of a box of crumpled letters, photographs and ephemera, perhaps, forgotten in the attic of some house I have long quitted. And the moment of first finding them in my grandparents' cupboard? All events have equal claims to a tenseless reality, says Professor Mellor. All have their address in space-time. Among them must be the contents of everyone's nows, whether past, present or future, remembered or forgotten, observed or unobserved. While it's not quite pleasing to hear that countless redundant trivialities are of the stuff of the universe, I like to think that the particular nows that have been picked out by our passionate attention to them are stacked away separately, as it were, in vaults, like paintings bought by a millionaire on the advice of experts. If connoisseurship of memory is the human role in this indiscriminately memorious world, then among those treasures is certainly my grandmother's quietly challenging utterance on first emptying out the box of spillikins for me. Now. Thank you. difficult to follow that, of course, but I would like to draw this part of the evening to a close by thanking, if one can sufficiently thank, all our speakers for their eloquence, and of course Tim for his inspirational reading, and for so much else besides. There's also been a great team of people who planned today's meetings, seminar, book lodge, and exhibition. <coughs> our huge thanks are due to Dan Carey, Jane Conroy, Nessa Cronin, Anne Cullinan, Mel Durkin, Kieran Hoare, Ashling Keane, Liz McConnell, Niall McSweeney and Anne Mitchell. The huge turnout this evening is also wonderful and thank you all very much for joining us. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the evening too. There's a reception outside in the atrium. So in addition to uh, consuming some food and drink, I hope you'll also be able to consume some of the exhibition which is out there too. So thank you very much. <laughs>